Hello, my name is uh, Jaap Vallaar. I'm editor of Rheumatology and I'm really pleased to have Dr. James Galloway here from King's College in London who is the senior author of a new BSR guideline on the monitoring of uh, conventional DMARs. Is that right? Good, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me to come talk to you. Yes. Um, so this is essentially an upgrade of an older guideline and um, so the question really arises why um, was it necessary to update this guideline? So you're right, it's a revision of a previous guideline. It's actually it's about 10 years since the previous guideline was written. We've had a number of new drugs that have come out in that time, uh, most recently at Tremolast, and some of the older drugs like penicillamine are no longer used. There's also been a, a shift in the evidence base around monitoring, um, which well, I think on the whole I think we all accept as a relatively evidence-free zone. Mm -hmm. um, and we've tried to do a number of things, and, and I think to give you some of the headlines of what we've changed, mm -hmm. um, the first thing, and based very much on, on feedback we've had from the users of the guideline and from the stakeholders, um, is we've harmonised a lot of the, mm -hmm. the recommendations around screening. So for example, all the drugs that require laboratory monitoring screening, mm -hmm. with very few exceptions, we have recommended a common monitoring protocol. So when you start a drug to do a fortnightly blood test um, for the first, uh, until they've been stable for six weeks, mm -hmm. then monthly out of six months, and then quarterly thereafter. And we have, and while there are some, some small caveats, that is essentially a one-size-fits-all approach. And we realise that the, the historic protocol was confusing, particularly in, in use in primary care. Right. Uh, the other thing that we've, we've looked at, uh, and based upon a, a fresh evidence base, is around methotrexate use in lung disease. Mm -hmm. I think we know that historically there have been some, uh, some associations between methotrexate and, and, uh, and interstitial lung disease that have been associations to confounding rather mm -hmm. than a, a genuine, co genuine causal relationship. Right. Two fantastic meta-analyses were published in the last couple of years and really suggesting that in, um, since about 2000, when there have been diagnostic classification criteria for drug-induced lung diseases, mm -hmm. and we've had access, access to HRCT, mm -hmm. um, the, the evidence that methotrexate is associated with lung disease has really been taken away. Certainly, whilst it can cause an acute pneumonitis, very rarely, chronic progressive lung disease with methotrexate that seems to have disappeared as an entity. Yeah. Um, so the new recommendations have said that ILD per se is not a contraindication okay. to any of the demons. Right. Although people with poor respiratory reserve, the yeah. risk of pneumonitis, you must yeah. be cautious about. Right. Okay, well that, that's, that's a, a very clear recommendation. And how about uh, hydroxychloroquine? That's all, always a, this yeah, a so matter of debate, <coughs> right? Um, yes, maybe I should have hoped you wouldn't ask me about that, because that is undoubtedly it is a change and it's probably mm. one of the more controversial bits. Mm. We, we've recommended that for someone starting hydroxychloroquine, there should be formal baseline assessment of the retina, so not a AMSL grid, mm. not just visual acuity, but um, ideally mm. OCT, which is essentially a scan of the back of the eye, a retinal scan, mm -hmm. um, which measures retinal thickness. And then no more screening is needed until the patient stays on the drug for more than five years and then they should enrol in annual OCT. Mm -hmm. um, that has significant implications, particularly resource implications. Mm -hmm. So we know OCT is widely available, it's the standard screening test for macular degeneration. Um, it's even available in some community settings, mm -hmm. in optician services, and has an NHS tariff um, of around about the, the £40 mark. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, we have a lot of people on hydroxychloroquine, so this mm -hmm. has a significant implication. And the reason we made the recommendation was on the evidence that if you base a, your assessment on AMSL grids or visual mm -hmm. acuity or colour vision, um, you won't detect visual loss until there is established macular disease. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the disease progresses even despite withdrawal of the drug. Mm -hmm. If you use OCT, the first thing is that you can identify people at baseline who are at increased risk and whom it would be prudent not to use the drug. And at follow-up, you can identify pre-symptomatic disease at a point where the, the macular changes are reversible. Mm -hmm. So the, the ophthalmology input has been very clear that, that that would be, based upon the existing evidence, the correct recommendation. Mm -hmm. It does make a question of, if you add that cost onto the use of hydroxychloroquine, mm -hmm. is it still a cost-effective drug, given its efficacy data in rheumatoid, which I think we all acknowledge it is one of the, the, the weaker agents, um, it does change potentially the, the role of that drug. Yeah more complex than lupus, where it has a much more firm position, 
Yeah. We use it in a young treatment population, and the data on retinal toxicity in lupus is, is very, very thin on yeah. the ground, or non existent. Really. Yeah. And I think it's crying out for research in that area to, to inform mm. the next edition of the ground. Yeah, yeah. And I, I presume a monitoring of JAK stat inhibitors is not yet included in this guideline, and, uh, but no. I presume maybe in so the future. Yeah, so the guideline, <coughs> we've set a revision date on the guideline in, in 2019. I, I think we plan to reconvene probably at the end of this year, being yeah. realistic, mm -hmm. um, at which time I, I think we're expecting we will have heard from NICE about JAK stat. Um, I'm sure we'll have a fight with the authors of the biologic guidelines as to where mm -hmm. it sits, although they are technically not biologics. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we, we will be looking to include those next time we do this. Right. Okay, well, I think this is a very important guideline for practicing rheumatologists, and I encourage all the readers of the journal to, to read this guideline in, in detail. And thank you very much, Dr. Galloway. Thank you very much for talking.